Good evening. I'm delighted and honored to have the opportunity this evening to discuss with you the question, is there evidence for God? And I'm privileged to be doing this with such an eminent scientist as Dr. Krauss. I hope that the debate tonight will be both enlightening as well as entertaining. Now, at one level, it seems to me indisputable that there's evidence for God. To say that there's evidence for some hypothesis is just to say that that hypothesis is more probable, given certain facts, than it would have been without them. That is to say, there's evidence for some hypothesis, H, if the probability of H is greater on the evidence and background information than on the background information alone. That is to say, the probability of H on E and B is greater than the probability of H on B alone. Now, in the case of God, if we let G stand for the hypothesis that God exists, it seems to me indisputable that God's existence is more probable, given certain facts, like the origin of the universe, the complex order of the universe, the existence of objective moral values, and so forth, than it would have been without them. That is, the probability of G on uh, E and B is greater than the probability of G on B alone. And I suspect that even most atheists would agree with that statement. So the question, is there evidence for God, isn't really very debatable. Rather, the really interesting question is whether God's existence is more probable than not. That is, is the probability of G on E and B greater than 50%? Now, I'll leave it up to you to assess that probability. My purpose in tonight's debate is much more modest, to share with you five pieces of evidence, each of which makes God's existence more probable than it would have been without it. Each of them is, therefore, evidence for God. Together, they provide powerful, cumulative evidence for theism. Number one, then, the existence of contingent beings. The deepest question of philosophy is why do contingent beings exist at all? By a contingent being, I mean a being which exists, but which might not have existed. Examples? Mountains, planets, galaxies, you and me. Such things might not have existed. By contrast, a necessary being is a being which exists by a necessity of its own nature. Its non-existence is impossible. Examples? Many mathematicians believe that numbers and other abstract objects exist in this way. If such entities exist, they just exist necessarily. Now, experience teaches that everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in its own nature, if it exists necessarily, or in an external cause, if it exists contingently. So, what about the universe? For by the universe, I mean all of space-time reality, not just our observable portion of it. What is the explanation of its existence? Well, since the universe is contingent in its existence, the explanation of the universe must be found in an external cause, which exists beyond time and space by a necessity of its own nature. Now, what could that be? Well, there are only two kinds of things that could fit that description, either abstract objects like numbers or God. But abstract objects don't stand in causal relations. The number seven, for example, has no effect upon anything. And therefore, it follows that the most plausible explanation of the universe is God. Hence, the existence of contingent beings makes God's existence more probable than it would have been without them. Although I've presented this reasoning inductively, we can also put it in the form of a deductive argument. Premise one, everything that exists has an explanation of its existence, either in its own nature or in an external cause. Two, the universe exists. Three, if the universe has an explanation of its existence, that explanation is God from which it follows logically, for, therefore, 
the explanation of the universe is God. Thus, the explanation for the existence of contingent beings is to be found in God. Number two, the origin of the universe. My first argument is consistent with the assumption that the universe is beginningless or eternal in the past. But is it? There are good reasons, both philosophically and scientifically, to doubt that the universe is beginningless. Philosophically, the idea of an eternal past seems absurd. Just think about it. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the series of uh, past events goes back to infinity, that the number of events in the past history of the universe is infinite. The mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, the number of past events must be finite. Therefore, the series of past events can't go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This philosophical conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. We now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning a finite time ago. In 2003, Arvin Bord, Alan Booth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which has, on average, been expanding throughout its history cannot be infinite in the past, but must have a past space-time boundary. What makes their proof so powerful is that it holds regardless of the physical description of the very early universe. Because we can't yet provide a physical description of the first split second of the universe, this brief moment has been fertile ground for speculations. But the bord booth vilenkin theorem is independent of the physical description of that moment. Their theorem implies that the quantum vacuum state out of which our material state may have evolved, which some scientific popularizations have misleadingly and inaccurately referred to as nothing, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have a beginning. Even if our universe is just a tiny part of a much grander multiverse composed of many universes, their theorem requires that the multiverse itself must have a beginning. Speculative theories such as pre-Big Bang inflationary scenarios have been crafted to try to avoid this absolute beginning, but none of these theories has succeeded in restoring an eternal past. At most, they just push the beginning back a step. But then the question inevitably arises, why did the universe come into being? What brought the vacuum state into existence? But unless you're willing to say that the universe just popped into being, uncaused out of absolute non-being, there must be a transcendent cause beyond space and time which created the universe. Clearly then, God's existence is more probable given the beginning of the universe than it would have been without it. We can also formulate this reasoning in the form of a deductive argument. One, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist, from which it follows logically that three, therefore, the universe has a cause. And again, as we've seen, the best candidate for such a transcendent cause is God. Number three, the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of our universe were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent agents with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. 
First, when the laws of nature are given mathematical expression, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities, which are just put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy in the very early universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by even a hair's breadth, the life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are incomprehensibly more probable than any life-permitting universe. Now, there are three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine-tuning. Physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because, as I've said, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. So, maybe the fine-tuning is due to chance. After all, highly improbable events happen every day. But what serves to distinguish purely chance events from design is not simply high improbability, but also the presence of an independently given pattern to which the event conforms. For example, in the movie Contact, scientists are able to distinguish a signal from outer space from random noise, not simply due to its high improbability, but because of its conformity to the pattern of the prime numbers. The fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent agents exhibits just that combination of incomprehensible improbability and conformity to an independently given pattern that are the earmarks of design. So, again, God's existence is clearly more probable, given the fine-tuning of the universe, than it would have been without it. We can also formulate this reasoning into a simple deductive argument. Premise one, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to physical necessity or chance, from which it follows logically three, therefore it is due to design. Thus, the fine-tuning of the universe implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Number four, objective moral values and duties in the world. By objective moral values, I mean moral values which are valid and binding whether anyone believes in them or not. Many theists and atheists agree that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective in this sense. For example, Michael Roos, an agnostic philosopher of science, asserts, morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. On a naturalistic view, moral values are just the byproduct of biological evolution and social conditioning. Just as a troop of baboons exhibit cooperative and even self-sacrificial behavior because natural selection has determined it to be advantageous in the struggle for survival, so their primate cousins, homo sapiens, have uh, evolved a sort of similar behavior for the same reason. As a result of sociobiological pressures, there has evolved among Homo sapiens a sort of herd morality that functions well in the perpetuation of our species. But on the atheistic view, there doesn't seem to be anything about this morality that makes it objectively binding and true. But the problem is that objective moral values and duties plausibly do exist. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of moral values and duties that impose themselves upon us. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. 
actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things, at least, are really wrong. Michael Roos himself admits, and I quote, the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Some things, at least, are really wrong. But in that case, the probability of God's existence is 1.0. We can formulate this reasoning as follows. One, if God did not exist, objective moral values and duties would not exist. Two, objective moral values and duties do exist, from which it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Number five, the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. The historical person Jesus of Nazareth was a remarkable individual. Historians have reached something of a consensus that the historical Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and as visible demonstrations of this fact, he carried out a ministry of miracle working and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands, and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three facts recognized by the majority of New Testament historians today, which I believe are best explained by Jesus' resurrection. Fact number one, on the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic Gert Ludemann, it may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Finally, fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus, despite having every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a defeated and dying Messiah, and Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Naturalistic attempts to explain these three great facts, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is there just is no plausible naturalistic explanation of these facts. And therefore, it seems to me the Christian is amply justified in believing that the best explanation of the evidence is that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. Thus, we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. In summary, then, we've looked at five lines of evidence, each of which makes God's existence more probable than it would have been without them. God's existence is obviously more probable, given these facts, than it would have been in their absence. They, therefore, constitute evidence for God. 
Indeed, I think their cumulative force makes God's existence very much more probable. But that is an assessment which each one of us will have to make for himself. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Dr. Krauss? Thank you. Hi there. Oh, good. That's up. Can you hear me? Good. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Uh, first, I want to thank Mark Stevens and the Campus Crusade for Christ, who have been remarkably hospitable and, and gracious to me uh, during the short time I've been here, and I really appreciate everything they've done. Uh, I do, I, profess, Dr. Craig is a, uh, is a professional debater. I'm not. I don't like debates, actually. I find them combative and not a good way to actually elucidate information and knowledge. But I agreed to come anyway. Um, some people have said I'm brave. Uh, some people I know are feeling I'm foolhardy. Uh, but actually, I want to I wanna compliment Dr. Craig for his bravery tonight. Um, because unlike the other debates I've seen him talk in, which have to do with the existence of God, which this debate, by the way, doesn't have to do with. I'm not here to disprove the existence of God in any way. I think that's kind of a futile and useless activity, something I wouldn't waste my time on. Uh, this is a debate, is there evidence for God? And that, therefore, makes it quite different in spirit. It's not a debate about philosophy, which is Dr. Craig's area of expertise, and I would not come to a debate to talk about semiotics or transubstantiation, because I recognize um, that I would not be probably competent to talk about that. But Dr. Craig came here to talk about evidence, which is uh, I take to be empirical and scientific. And Dr. Craig is not a scientist, as he has demonstrated several times in the last few minutes. Uh, the, onus, the important thing about this debate also is that the onus is, not, the onus is on Dr. Craig to demonstrate evidence for God. I'm, uh, the onus is not on me to disprove anything. The onus is on Dr. Craig to demonstrate evidence, and then I, I guess I'm here to talk about whether I view that as evidence. And uh, that's very different, I think, in spirit than, than a number of the other debates that Dr. Craig has been involved in, and, and I, I, I congratulate him for his bravery to do that, or maybe foolhardiness, we'll see. Um, now, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And in fact, uh, I, uh, I, I, I will get to the fact that Dr. Claims, um, Dr. Craig's claim for what evidence is is not at all what we use in science nowadays. Uh, it doesn't relate at all to what we use in science. But uh, one could imagine, I mean, there's no more extraordinary claim, I think, than the fact that there is a divine, infinitely powerful intelligence that exists, that creates the universe, and then largely disappears. And that, except maybe in a few places making itself manifest to Bronze Age peasants before YouTube or anything else that could record the evidence. Not only that, I should point out that it is a far cry from claiming that there may be cosmological arguments for the existence of a divine intelligence. There's no logical connection between that and the God that Dr. Craig just talked about who shows great interest in the, in the personal affairs of human beings roughly a million years after they were uh, uh, evolved. And um, uh, in fact, a personal God that Dr. Craig happens to believe in, but not a personal God that other people have to believe in. There's no logical connection between a God who, create, who might, a divine intelligence that might create the universe, and Christ. There's not, not, nothing at all. Now, it would be easy to have evidence for God. If the, if the stars rearranged themselves tonight, and, set, and I looked up tonight and saw something, well, not here, but a place where there was, you could see the stars, in Arizona, say, and I looked up tonight in the star, and I saw the stars rearrange themselves, say, I am here. Gee, that's pretty interesting evidence. And in fact, when we talk about evidence, the only evidence you can have for God is really the miraculous evidence. Because the existence of God implies something that is supernatural, something beyond that which can be explained by physical theory. So if you're going to have evidence for God, it has to be miraculous evidence. Now, I'm not a, also not a huge fan of philosophy, but I thought I would quote a philosopher in deference to Dr. Craig, and that's David Hume, who said, who defined a miracle to be the following. No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood 
would be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavors to establish. So if you're claiming you have evidence for a miracle, the fact that that evidence is false has to be even stranger than the evidence itself. And of course, that doesn't apply to anything Dr. Craig has talked about, as I'll try and describe. It's a, therefore, in fact, the kind of evidence that Dr. Craig would need to show is incredibly high. He has to jump a huge hurdle. The criterion that we should use to judge his evidence for this extraordinary claim, this miraculous claim, I repeat, this miraculous claim, you have to ask yourself, is the possibility that that claim is false more miraculous than the claim itself? And I think if you're serious about that logic, you'll find that in every case that he's mentioned, it's, it's not the case. Now, the other thing that Dr. Craig has talked about is logic. And the interesting thing about the universe is it's not logical. At least it's not classically logical. That's one of the great things about science. It's taught us that the universe is the way it is, whether we like it or not. And much of what Dr. Craig has talked about, and we'll talk about again tonight, is the fact that he doesn't like certain ideas. He doesn't like the idea of infinity. He doesn't like the idea of beginning. He doesn't like the idea of chance. And in fact, it doesn't make sense to him. He doesn't, even, he doesn't like a universe in which morality is defined as allowing rape. Doesn't make sense to him. But the point is, if we, we, if we continue to rely on our understanding of the universe, on Aristotelian logic, on classical logic, about what we think is sensible, we would still be living in a world where heavier objects, we think, fall faster than light objects because they're heavier, as Aristotle used to think, instead of doing the experiment to check it out. We cannot rely on what we perceive to be sensible. We have to rely on what the universe tells us is sensible. What we have to do is force our beliefs to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around. And the, the universe just simply isn't sensible. Uh, let me, I, I think I have an example. I can't, I, and here's, I have two quotes from Richard Feynman because I just wrote a book about him, which I hope you all buy. But, um, uh, but you know, th this is really important. This is one of the key, one of the reasons I'm a scientist is that crazy ideas end up not being crazy. If you, if the, if you see something that's, that seems impossible, that it happens, the onus is in you to understand why and to force your, your thinking to conform to that. And it's been one of the great pleasures of doing 20th and 21st century physics that we've been able to do that in many areas from quantum mechanics to relativity. And, and this idea that something that looks completely paradoxical at first, if analyzed to completion in all its details and in all experimental situations, may in fact be paradoxical, is a profound, may in fact not be paradoxical, I should say, is in fact a profound, profound importance. We can't just say we don't like something and therefore God exists, which is essentially, as far as I can tell, behind every single one of Dr. Craig's statements that he made tonight. And we'll have a chance, I hope, to go over some of them. But let, get, let me give you an example. You see, I kind of figured I'm not going to change many minds. So I'm an educator, and I figured I'd teach you a little quantum mechanics. Okay? Um, because it gives you a sense of how strange and crazy the world is. So if I have a, there's a famous experiment that's been performed. If I have a wall with two slits and I have bullets that I shoot through a gun, and I hope no one here has one, um, uh, the, the, uh, through those, and I just shoot it randomly through those two slits, then the bullet will go in one place, or it'll, it'll go in another place. Oops, I got the wrong thing there, but that's okay. We can leave that there for a second. So what you'll expect to see in the slits is either a lot of holes there and a lot of holes there and nothing else. Okay. If you shoot a wave through two slits, and some of you may have been subjected to this in physics classes, you'll find something very different. The wave, in fact, will go through both slits, interfere with, with, with itself, and create what's called an interference pattern. If you've ever seen two waves come together in the ocean, you see these beautiful patterns of ripples that are just spectacular to see, and it's one of the great joys of physics to see them. But the amazing thing is that when we shoot electrons, particles, at two slits, what pattern do we see? We see exactly the same pattern we would see with waves. Now that's crazy, because electrons are particles. So you say, well, maybe they're waves. But no, let's see. I don't believe they're waves, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a light at, right here at the slits, and I'm going to check where each electron goes through. 
because I want because right now it looks in order to create this pattern, the only way you can create that pattern is if the electron went through both slits at the same time. That's insane. It's like infinity. Okay? So that, that's insane. So I put a light there and I shine it. What happens? I see each electron goes through only one slit or the other. Aha! I proved that it doesn't go through both. But then when I look at the pattern, the pattern's different. If I shine the light and look at the electron, I just see those two, two lines that I talked about earlier, right here and here. If I don't shine the light on the electron, the pattern is different. If I don't shine the light on the electron, we now know the electron goes through both slits at the same time. It does something classically impossible. And when we saw that, we didn't say, you know what, God exists. What we said is, well, maybe the laws of nature are stranger than we thought, and maybe we better figure out how things behave so we can explain and predict things. And the, world, the universe is stranger than you think in almost every way. In fact, I cannot resist this because Dr. Craig mentioned it. Sorry, I'm, I'm not going to go all the way down, I promise. <laughs> but I, I wore a t-shirt because it was cold, and I can't resist. It's worth a thousand words, so it's okay. Okay. <laughs> two plus two equals five, my t-shirt says, for extremely large values of two. Now that's extremely important because in fact classical logic such as 2 plus 2 equals 5 uh, is 4, it can equal 5 is wrong. Mathematicians and physicists know that for extremely large values of numbers you have to change the rules. And in fact, let's go to some of the things Dr. Craig talked about. In fact, the existence of infinity which he talked about which is Self-contradictory is not self-contradictory at all. Mathematicians know precisely how to deal with infinity. So do physicists. We rely on infinities. In fact, there's a field of mathematics called complex variables, which is the basis of much of modern physics, from electromagnetism to quantum mechanics and beyond. Where, in fact, we learn how to deal with infinity. We, without the infinities, we couldn't do the physics. We know how to sum infinite series because we can do complex analysis. Mathematicians have taught us how. It's strange and very unappetizing. And, and in fact, you can sum things that look ridiculous. For example, if you sum the series 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 to infinity, what's the answer? Minus 112. You don't like it? Too bad. The mathematics is consistent if we assign that. The world is the way it is, whether we like it or not. So let's talk about the five pieces of evidence that, that Dr. Gray talked about. The existence of contingent beings, beings that didn't have to exist. Well, accidents happen all the time. Many things happen that are just accidental. We assign significant, we are hardwired to want to believe. That's very important. We all want to believe in a host of things. We all have to convince ourselves of 10 impossible things before breakfast in order to get up in the morning, that we like school or we love the person in the, in the bed next to us, or something. It's, the, it's what we need as human beings to exist. We want to believe, we need to believe, but accidents sometimes happen. You can, for example, have a million dreams over a million nights, but let's pretend it's not a million, let's just say it's a thousand nights, that are nonsensical. One night, you dream that your friend is going to break their arm. Next day, your friend breaks your leg. Aha! Something significant. But of course, you forget all the times your dreams were nonsensical. Again, Richard Feynman used to go up to people and say, you, you know what happened to me? You won't believe what happened to me today. You just won't believe it. You just won't believe it. You'd say, what? You'd say, absolutely nothing. Okay? Because most of the time when things happen, we don't, they're not significant, but we ascribe significance to them. Contingent things happen all the time without necessarily having a cause. But, even if they do have a cause, 
If we don't understand the cause, it doesn't mean that God exists. It seemed to me that, that, that Dr. Craig's first example is a characteristic example of God in the gaps. We don't know all the processes which led to the existence of human beings, therefore God exists. Well, that's just an awful excuse for God. Because that God of the gaps argument risks God disappearing when we discover the cause. And we discover the cause is simply physical. We now know, in fact, getting to his origin of the universe and also whether the universe is contingent or not. The universe, Dr. Craig argued that we know the universe isn't contingent. It had to exist. How does he know that? I don't know that. How do we know that? We don't know the answer. It's fine not to know the answer. There's nothing wrong with not knowing the answer. In fact, not knowing the answer is exciting because it means there's a lot to learn. To argue that from some basic principle, we know the universe had to exist is, is myopic in the extreme. Or perhaps, in my opinion, intellectually lazy. Instead of saying, let's see, let's go out and try and spend our lives trying to understand what processes might have caused it to exist, and whether it might not have existed, and whether there may be many universes, I will just make the assumption because I like it. Well, God of the gaps is not, a good not good evidence for, for God. It's not also good evidence for sound thinking. The origin of the universe, again, coming back to Dr. Craig's argument, that it, it can't be eternal. Well, we do know. In fact, Dr. Craig said there's good evidence for a Big Bang. Well, there's more than good evidence for a Big Bang. We know a Big Bang happened. The Big Bang is a fact. It happened 13.72 billion years ago. And the fact that we can say so to four decimal places is one of their most remarkable feats of modern science that we should all herald and, and, and use to, un, to and exalt as an example of how remarkable it is to be a human being who could think. These are the fact that we now here sitting in the middle of no place, in the middle of a random, around a random star, in the middle of a random galaxy, in the middle of a universe of 400 billion galaxies, a universe which is made, in fact, which the galaxies and the stars are largely irrelevant. And the human beings and the aliens that live on those stars are largely irrelevant. We have now learned that the mass of the universe, well, one, less than 1% 1 of the universe is made up of everything we can see. All the stars, all the galaxies, all the planets, everything is a bit of cos cosmic pollution in a universe made up of dark matter and dark energy. Things which are invisible, but we know exist because we can measure them, because we can falsify them. That's the other aspect of evidence. Evidence must be falsifiable. I could argue that Dr. Craig has three legs. I see he has three legs right here. Oh, but whenever he stands up and you look at him, he only has two. It one disappears. Okay? Now that's not falsifiable evidence. I could argue, I could argue that we don't ex we didn't exist less than five seconds ago. How can you prove me wrong? I could argue that God created the universe four and a half seconds ago with all of us sitting here believing we heard Dr. Craig. There's no way I could disprove that. And there's no way I would want to try and disprove it. Because it's not falsifiable. It's not, in a scientific sense, it's not evidence. Now, actually, Dr. Craig, when he talked about Alan Guth, was, of course, wrong. Um, the actual first person to talk about uh, the fact that the universe had to begin at a finite time in a singularity is Stephen Hawking, um, who made some singularity theorems with Roger Penrose. But the interesting thing is Stephen Hawking has also argued, as in fact we now know, given quantum gravity, that universes can spontaneously appear. In fact, one of the things about quantum, quantum mechanics is nothing, not only can nothing become something, nothing always becomes something. Nothing is unstable. Nothing will always produce something in quantum mechanics. And if you apply quantum mechanics to gravity, you can show that it's possible that space and time themselves can come into existence when nothing existed before. So that's not a problem. Now, in fact, what Guth has argued is, in fact, that a theorem that he, that a, 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 a theory that he postulated to explain the data, not because he wanted to answer some metaphysical question about whether God existed or not, a theorem that he made to explain the data called inflation actually predicts essentially an infinite number of universes in an eternal multiverse that exists for all time and for all space. It's eternal. It didn't have a beginning. We don't know if it had a cause, but it doesn't matter. Because our universe could spontaneously appear out of that multiverse. 
So the idea of a first cause is not relevant. I, I think I'll, I, I, I'll go to Jesus of Nazareth with that, with, later, but and fine tuning, where, where in fact Dr. Craig is completely wrong. The universe is not fine tuned for life. No scientist says the universe is fine tuned for human life. That is an incorrect statement. Let me just go to last his, his morality argument. We don't know if there's an objective morality. There may or may not be. That's an interesting question, but whether there is or not, it doesn't imply God. For example, we talked about rape. If God set subjective morality, if God decided that raping two-year-old girls was okay, would it be okay? Most of you, I think, would say no. Why would it be okay? Because it's not moral. But if it's not moral, then God didn't have the choice. It's not God that chose what's moral. And therefore, if morality is based on what's rational, then why not get rid of the middleman and get rid of God? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. Dr. Craig, it's time for your 12-minute rebuttal. You'll recall that in my opening speech, I said that there's evidence for God's existence just in case the probability of God's existence is higher, given the five facts that I mentioned, than it would have been without them. This is the standard definition of is evidence for used in probability theory. And I'm astonished to hear Dr. Krauss attacking logic and Bayesian probability theory is the basis for his argument. That uh, is simply unsound. You cannot deny logic without assuming logic in order to deny it. It's a self-defeating situation. Now, of course, quantum mechanics is surprising and shocking, paradoxical, but it's not illogical. It is not as though contradictions are true. So in affirming and going with the rules of logic and with probability theory, I am right in line with rational thought. And if the price of atheism is irrationality, well, then I'll, I'll leave them to it. Now, he says that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, David Hume's argument against miracles uh, is sound. Here, what you need to understand is that that claim is demonstrably false. It is not true. Hume didn't understand the probability calculus. It wasn't yet developed in his day. His argument neglects the crucial probability that we would have the evidence which we do if the miracle in question had not occurred. And that factor can completely balance out any intrinsic improbability that you might think occurs in a miracle. In any case, why well, think that a miracle like the resurrection is intrinsically improbable? I think what's improbable is that Jesus rose naturally from the dead. But of course, that's not the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And you can't show that's intrinsically improbable unless you're prepared to argue that the existence of God is improbable. And Dr. Krauss isn't doing that tonight. That's not the debate topic, as he explained. The topic tonight is, is there evidence for God? And so we're not assessing the prior probabilities of whether or not God's existence is intrinsically probable or not. And so I think that the approach that I'm taking tonight is right in line with probability theory and does show that given the facts that I've laid out, God's existence is more probable than it would have been without them. He says that there could be better evidence. God could rearrange the stars in the sky. You know, if the stars did that, that would be vastly more probable than the fine-tuning of the initial conditions of the universe that I discussed. And therefore, if that would be good evidence for the existence of God, so is the fine-tuning that I've discussed already. He says, but 2 plus 2 uh, does not necessarily equal 5. 2 plus 2 equals 5 follows from the axioms of Peano arithmetic, which are necessary truths. I, I, I cannot believe that he would deny logical, necessary mathematical truths uh, in order to avoid theism. So let's talk first about the existence of contingent beings. Uh, here I explained that contingent beings are more probable given God's existence than given atheism. Dr. Cross will have to say that the existence of contingent beings is just as probable on atheism as it is on theism. But that seems incorrect because atheism has no explanation for the existence 
of contingent beings. Dr. Krauss says, well, accidents just happen. Your friend might break a leg after having a dream. But notice that there are explanations for accidents. That's why when something goes wrong, for example, in a space shuttle uh, launch, we look for the cause of what the, uh, uh, made the accident occur. He says, well, is the universe uh, contingent? Uh, perhaps the universe uh, it doesn't exist necessarily. My argument was that the universe doesn't exist necessarily, that it's contingent in its being. Scientists regularly discuss other models of the universe that are logically possible. The universe is governed by different laws of nature, and therefore clearly the universe is not ultimate in the sense of being self-explanatory. And you can't say that it's contingent and yet ultimate without explanation because that would be arbitrary and unjustified. It commits what's been called the taxicab fallacy, which is thinking you can dismiss the need for explanation when you arrive at your desired destination. And it's simply arbitrary to apply the explanatory principle everywhere else in life, but then deny it when you get to the existence of the universe itself. What about the origin of the universe? Here he says that the universe doesn't need to begin to exist because we know in mathematics how to deal with infinities, for example, how to sum infinities. Well, of course in mathematics you can do that. Mathematics has certain conventions and rules that you use but to prevent contradictions from occurring. For example, in transfinite arithmetic, the inverse operations of subtraction and division are prohibited because they lead to contradictions. But while you can slap the hand of the mathematician who tries to break the rules, if you've got, say, an infinite number of baseball cards, you can't stop for someone from giving away part of the cards. And so you will have contradictions when you translate it into reality it may be possible on paper in the realm of mathematics, but it's not possible in the realm of reality. And lest you think that this is not reasoning that impresses contemporary scientists, let me quote from George Ellis, a great cosmologist, when he asked, can there be an infinite set of really existing universes? He says, we suggest on the basis of well-known philosophical arguments that the answer is no, and therefore they reject a realized past infinity in time. Now, what about the Big Bang confirmation? Dr. Gu uh, Dr. Krauss appeals to Stephen Hawking's model. Hawking's model involves an absolute beginning of the universe. It has a beginning of the, of the universe, though it doesn't have a beginning point of infinite density. He says, but it can come into being out of nothingness because nothing is unstable. This is the grossly misleading use of nothingness for describing the quantum vacuum, which is empty space filled with vacuum energy. It is a rich physical reality described by physical laws and having a physical structure. If a religious person were to so seriously misrepresent a scientific theory as this, he would be accused of deliberate distortion and abuse of science, and I think rightly so. What the quantum vacuum is, is a roiling sea of energy. It is not nothing. As Dr. Uh, uh, Krauss himself has said, and I quote, by nothing, I don't mean nothing. Nothing isn't nothing anymore in physics. Empty space is not empty. Nothing is really a bubbling, boiling brew of virtual particles. And my point is that that quantum vacuum state cannot be eternal in the past. That was the implication of the bord guth vilenkin theorem. Listen to what Vilenkin writes. He, said, he, he says, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And given the absolute beginning of the universe, the beginning of the quantum vacuum, uh, God's existence is obviously more probable than it would have been without it. As for the fine-tuning of the universe, all Dr. Krauss said is that the universe is not fine-tuned for human life. I agree completely. It is fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent, embodied, interactive agents, but not necessarily human beings. And the chances of that happening are so infinitesimal that it's far more probable to think that this is the result of design. What about objective moral values and duties in the world? Here, he doesn't deny that objective moral values and duties would not exist without God. 
Indeed, on Dr. Krause's view, you do not have objective moral duties because you don't have free will. He says in his lecture, I don't think we have free will. But then moral duties are impossible because it's an ethical maxim that ought implies can. If you cannot avoid an action, then you're not morally responsible for it. And so there cannot be objective moral duties in a deterministic universe. But I submit to you that that is just utterly implausible. And here I'll appeal to Sam Harris in his recent book, The Moral Landscape. Harris says that there is only one person in the world who held down a struggling, screaming little girl and cut off her genitals with a septic blade and then sewed her back up. The only question would be how severely he should be punished. It would not be a question that he had done something horribly, objectively wrong. And yet on Dr. Krauss's view, you cannot affirm that because everything is working according to the clockwork universe. Ought implies can, and you can't do other than what you do. As for moral values, Dr. Krauss says reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, is still there. Well, that occasions a question. Are moral values real? Are they still there if no one believes in them? Not on Dr. Krauss's scientism and determinism. And the irony is that science itself depends upon these moral values. Dr. Krauss has said in his lecture, the ethos of science includes honesty, open-mindedness, creativity, anti-authoritarianism, full disclosure, the basis of what is a moral society. But the problem is these are all illusions on his view, so that science ultimately is predicated upon illusion, uh, which I submit is implausible. So given the existence of objective moral values and duties, I think it is more probable that God exists. What about Jesus' resurrection? Here, all he said was, how do you connect the existence of God to Christ? Well, you do it in the following way. Christ claimed to be the absolute revelation of the God of Israel. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come. If God raised him from the dead, then this is a miraculous event which ratifies and vindicates the radical claims that Jesus of Nazareth made about himself, and therefore it follows that the God revealed by Jesus exists. So it seems to me that Dr. Krauss has got to deny the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, and the origin of the belief in Jesus' resurrection, because given those facts, God's existence is obviously more probable than without them. And yet that would put him in conflict with the majority of New Testament historians today on a subject about which I think he would admit he knows very little. So given the facts accepted by the majority of historians, it seems to me that it is much more probable that God exists and that God raised Jesus from the dead than otherwise. In summary then, it seems to me that when you look at this evidence, clearly God's existence is more probable given these facts than it would have been without them. And that's all that is, needs to be established in order to show that there is evidence for the existence of God. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Dr. Krauss? Okay. Um, we don't understand the beginning of the universe. We don't understand if the universe had a cause. That is a fascinating possibility. By the way, there's the picture of the vacuum that Dr. Craig so adequately described that I talked about. It's not the nothing that I'm going to talk about in a second. It's one version of nothing. That's empty space. That's what it looks like according to the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity. Empty space is indeed a boiling, bubbling brew of particles. In fact, you have mass because of it. And each of these things appears with some random probability, completely contingent. You can't predict. You can't say that, that, that this particle appears and disappears at that place for an instant for a reason. There's no reason you can predict it. There's no, there's no uh, insistent cause. It's a probability. It may happen, it may not. It's just the way the world works. But the beginning is fascinating. Now you have two choices. You could say it's a fascinating thing and we should investigate it. We should try and understand it. We should try and ask the question, is there a cause? And if, the cause, what, if there's a cause, what is it? That's what science has done. You know, Steven Weinberg, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, has said science doesn't make it impossible to believe in God which is absolutely true. He says, however, it makes it possible to not believe in God. 
Because before God, everything's a miracle. Before God, earthquakes were a miracle. But what you could say is, well, I don't understand earthquakes, but maybe I'll try and understand them so that I can predict an earthquake, so I can save people's lives in, in Japan the next time there might be one. So what I can do is say, if I don't understand something, I can say, it's God, give up. That's it, God's will. Or I can say, let me try and understand it. So the lack, I repeat, the lack of understanding of something is not evidence for God. It's evidence of a lack of understanding. And what we should do, if we're scientists, or anyone, is try and say, let's try and understand it before we go the intellectually lazy route of saying, I don't understand it, so let me assign it to an entity that I can't understand, a divine entity beyond my comprehension. If I did that, if we did that, we wouldn't be in this room today. We wouldn't be seeing these images because none of modern science would have happened. Instead, we try and understand how things work. And the way science works is if there's a physical effect, we look for a physical cause. And so far, there's not a single place in the history of science where we've been, we've gotten to a point where we can't explain something and, and we know for certain there's no explanation. Every time something was, every explanation that's remarkable is remarkable for that fact. It explains something we didn't think we'd ever understand. That's the beauty of science. Now, the interesting thing is that, that let, me, let me go to, to discuss nothing. Um, I was going to say Dr. Gates an expert on it, but I won't. Uh, because, but in a sense he is, because he studied what I said. Um, and and I, I've talked about the fact that, that empty space is not empty. Nothing is not nothing. But that's not the, the point is that that's one version of nothing. One version is of, of that, again, defies conventional wisdom, that defies conventional logic, that, that a, a century ago, if we'd been having this debate, Dr. K would say something can never come from nothing. Nothing can ever rise from empty space. Empty space is, em is empty, and the only way you can get something out of empty space is if God creates it. Well, he could have said that, and that would have agreed with what we understood at the time, but it's not true. Now we know, poof, out of empty space, uh, you all arose. Out of empty space, all of you arose. Quantum fluctuations in the early history of the universe produced mass density fluctuations, which produced galaxies, stars, people. So, it's amazing. It's fantastic, and we should, we should, it's, it's just, I love talking about it. I'd rather talk about that than what I'm about to talk about. But, but that's not the only kind of nothing. The kind of nothing that I talked about that Stephen Hawking mentioned is a more extreme version of nothing. Still not, maybe you might argue, complete nothing. But in quantum gravity, if, and it's a theory we don't yet fully understand, but if we apply quantum mechanics to gravity, and gravity is a theory of space and time, the quantum mechanics tells us that space and time themselves, not the space in which these things are appearing, but space itself spontaneously appears. There was no space, there was no time, and, it's, and, a, and a region of space and time spontaneously appears. It's very different than the quantum fluctuations that are happening in empty space, in which Dr. Craig talked about. I agree. That's not complete nothing. It's a version of nothing in itself. It's so remarkable that we should be amazed by it. But quantum gravity says that space and time can come out of nothing, so that, that where there's no space, no time. Now, Dr. Craig, I could let him wait and rebut this and then rebut it again in the next one, but I'll give him a break. You might say, Dr. Craig would say, I think, it is, and I bet he would be writing this note, because I'd be if I were him. But that's not nothing either. Because nothing, at least there are laws. At least there are laws. So the laws were there that, that uh, of which you know, empty space arose. So space, indeed there was nothing in the conventional sense that there was no space, no time, no universe. It's perfectly plausible that a universe can be created where there was no space before. In fact, again, in quantum gravity, it's not only plausible, it's required. It's required that, that you cannot have that event not happen somewhere. But the laws are there. Well, it turns out, the interesting thing about some of the work that Alan Booth and, and, and Alex Lincoln, good friends of mine, have been working on, and I discuss with them all the time, you will notice if you read their paper, unlike Dr. Craig, that you will not see the word God mentioned anywhere in their paper. Because although they talk about um, uh, a theorem of, of an absolute beginning, they do not in any way say that this proves the existence of God or this is evidence for God. In fact, you won't find it anywhere. But what you will find is an interesting discussion that this suggests that, in fact, 
that there are required to be many universes, maybe even an infinite number of universes. In fact, in eternal inflation, there must be an infinite number of universes. And, and whether we like it or not, that multiverse may be eternal and infinite. And even if we don't like it, and even if Dr. Craig doesn't like to think we can work with it, it may be the case. It's not up to us to decide. Okay? And the interesting thing about that infinite set of universes is that each of them has a different set of laws. The laws are random. There are no prescribed laws of nature in such a view. The laws of nature are completely accidental. And in such a picture, we arise here, but not by any fine-tuning anymore. And I don't know if Dr. Craig accepts the facts of evolution. I believe he probably does, but he can let us know. But this miraculous fine-tuning that he's talking about is nothing other than a kind of cosmic natural selection. We find ourselves living in a universe in which we can live. It's nothing more profound than that. We don't find ourselves living in a universe in which we could live. It's like, as, as uh, uh, Andre Linde, one of, one of, who also was, works with Alan Guth and Belenkin on these topics, has said, if you were an intelligent fish, you might ask the question, why is the universe made of water? The answer would be, because if it wasn't made of water, you wouldn't be around to ask the question. And so, in such a universe, it's no more miraculous that we exist than that bees can tell the colors of flowers, that animals seem so well designed to their environment. That illusion of design that occurs in nature, in biology, is a process of, of natural selection. We understand it now. We understand how physical processes can produce things that look like they're incredibly fine-tuned. We understand that you don't need supernatural imposition to make what appears to be fine-tuning. But, in fact, you know, the, well, let, let me just say that, that philosophy and, no, uh, and nothing, when we talk, what, what nothing is, to go back, it's something I want, really think it's important, I want to go back to what I was going to say before, that nothing, philosophy has taught us something about nothing. What it's taught us of is that philo the definition of nothing is that which philosophy has taught us about nothing. Because what we learn to, un to understand when it comes to nothingness is not what we think in our minds, but what the world tells us. This is one kind of nothing. The nothingness in Hawking's theory is another kind of nothing. And the nothingness in which there's no laws of nature, they're random, they occur with different laws everywhere, and physics is environmental accident, is another kind of nothing. Another kind of universe without cause, multiverse without cause, without beginning, without end. We don't know what the right answer is, but we're willing to look at all the possibilities, but none of them require anything supernatural. Now, in fact, the let me go back to the statement I made earlier, which was kind of ad hominem, and now I'm trying to explain why Doc, Dr. Craig does not, why evidence, as he's described it, is not evidence of science. A prob first of all, a probability greater than 50% is not evidence of anything. It's evidence that there's a possibility that a construct might be right. There's also a possibility that it might be wrong. For example, in my own field of dark matter detection, one of the things I work in, there was a recent uh, discovery of several events and the experimentalists uh, that may be due to these dark matter particles. Two events where you predict none. You find out the probability of that, is about not, uh, the, of that being due to pure accident is, is one part in 10. A 10% probability of that being a mere accident, 90% probability of it being perhaps due to dark matter. The experiment, however, did not claim evidence for dark matter because we don't claim 90% evidence is good enough, especially for extraordinary claim. We require two, three, or four sigma or five sigma effects. So when we have a 10% likelihood that something's an accident, it could be an accident. We never claim discovery based on that. Now, the other thing that surprised me is Dr. Craig, Dr. Craig claimed to talk about Bayesian statistics. The key aspect of probability, Bayesian probabilities as we use them in science, is that if your conclusions change dramatically depending upon your prior, then you haven't proved anything. And all of his conclusions, of course, would, are dramatically dependent upon his assumption that God exists. If you just allow for the possible, the question you have to ask in every one of his cases, from the fact that we're here and we didn't have to be here, the fact that the universe may or may not have an origin, the fact that there's fine-tuning, although I will get in the last minute to the fact that there isn't fine-tuning, the fact that there may or may not be objective values, and the fact that Jesus of Nazareth claimed he was God, you can ask yourself, is it equally plausible that we're here by physical phenomena, that the universe had a beginning that was produced by physics, that this fine-tuning that happened the same way as fine-tuning in biology happened, appears to happen by natural causes. 
that objective moral values may or may not exist, doesn't, doesn't prove anything, and that Jesus may have thought he was God, but wasn't God. Is that equally plausible? I think I'll say, well, I, uh, given that I have 30 seconds left, I think I will just say that the fine-tuning argument, which we'll, I'll get, I promise I'll get to in the next phase, is not fine-tuning at all. The laws of physics can change dramatically. In fact, what Dr. Craig said is that the laws of nature are fine-tuned for any intelligence is not true. We don't know what any intelligence could be like. What we do know is they allow us. So we got it exactly wrong. They allow humans, but we don't know if any other kind of intelligence could exist. Since I'm told to stop, I will stop. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. Dr. Craig? Well, I was gratified that in his last speech, Dr. Krauss ceased to attack uh, probability theory and uh, logic. Instead, what he says now, it's not enough to prove that God's existence is more probable, given the uh, evidence, than it is on the background information alone. You've got to discuss the prior probabilities as well. He's absolutely correct. But as he said in his opening speech, that's not the subject of tonight's debate. And that's why we're not listening, looking at, for example, what is the evidence against the existence of God? We're not asking Dr. Krauss to give the evidence against God's existence. We're not talking about the prior probability of God's existence. We're talking about one aspect of the probability calculus, namely, is it the case that God's existence is more probable, given the evidence and the background information I mentioned, than just on the background information alone? If it is, it follows that there's evidence for God. Now, that doesn't prove that God exists, but that's not the topic of the debate tonight, and I've never claimed that it does. I've simply argued that there is evidence that, God, uh, that there is God, and I think that the evidence is clear. What about the first point of evidence, that the existence of contingent beings is more probable on God's existence than on atheism? He didn't deny the point. Remember, I explained to deny the uh, explanatory principle of the universe is to commit the taxicab fallacy. It's arbitrary and unjustified. What about the origin of the universe? Here he accuses me of using God of the gaps reasoning, says we should simply say we don't understand, we should continue to investigate rather than appeal to God. Now it's very important that you understand tonight that I am not using science to prove God. I'm using science as evidence that the universe began to exist. That is a religiously neutral statement that can be found in any textbook on astronomy and astrophysics. Beyond that, I'm making the extra scientific philosophical claim that God's existence is more probable given the beginning of the universe than it would have been without it. So the question is, does the scientific evidence support the beginning of the universe? Well, the born guth vilenkin theorem requires it. Vilenkin says the remarkable thing about this theorem is its sweeping generality. We did not even assume that gravity is described by Einstein's equations. The only assumption we made was that the expansion rate of the universe never gets below some non-zero value. This assumption should certainly be satisfied in the inflating false vacuum. The conclusion is that past eternal inflation without a beginning is impossible. So we have both philosophical grounds as well as scientific grounds for affirming the beginning of the universe. Now, Dr. Uh, Krauss says, but the um, Hawking model from quantum tunneling involves a different concept of nothing. Uh, there is no classical time and space in the point from which the universe originates. But it is still something. And Vilenkin, who also has a quantum tunneling model, recognizes this. Vilenkin says the initial state from which the universe evolves is not nothing. I understand that a universe of zero radius is not necessarily the same thing as no universe at all. There is a three geometry that evolves uh, through quantum tunneling into our space-time. It's not nothing. James Sinclair, a cosmologist, says this approach still does not solve the problem of creation. Rather, it has moved the question back one step to the initial, tiny, closed, and metastable universe. This universe state can have existed for only a finite time. Where did it come from? Why is Dr. Krauss so insistent on denying the scientific evidence points to the beginning of the universe? 
That's not a supernatural conclusion. That doesn't imply the existence of God in and of itself. If we follow the scientific evidence where it leads, all of the evidence that I'm aware of points to the fact that the universe is not past eternal. If we have any evidence that the universe is past eternal, I'd love to hear Dr. Krauss present it. I'm not aware that there's any evidence that suggests the universe is past eternal. As I said, the uh, attempts to avoid the born guth vilenkin theorem all involve exotic, uh, implausible models, which in the end fail to restore an eternal past. They just push the beginning back a step. So we've got good philosophical and scientific grounds for thinking the universe began to exist. And since something can't come out of nothing, and I hear I mean non-being, then there must be a transcendent cause to bring the universe, uh, universe into existence, which I think makes God's existence more probable. As for the fine-tuning, we keep getting promissory notices on this, uh, but haven't heard yet why the universe is not fine-tuned for embodied agents. Postulating the existence of many worlds, as Dr. Krauss would want to do, doesn't do anything to explain why we observe a universe structured for embodied interactive agents, unless you can show that the vast preponderance of observable universes are so structured. And that can't be shown. For there are observable universes in which a single brain fluctuates into existence out of the quantum vacuum. Such worlds are not fine-tuned for interactive agents like ourselves, but they are observable. And so just appealing to many worlds doesn't do anything to explain why we observe a world fine-tuned for embodied interactive agents like ourselves. And in any case, that really only kicks the problem up one step, because then you've got to ask about the fine-tuning of the multiverse. What determined its laws, that they should be so special? So we've yet to hear, I think, any good explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe. Just to give you a couple of stats on this, the fine-tuning of the low entropy condition of the universe is one part out of 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 123. The fine-tuning of gravity is around one part out of 10 to the 36. The fine-tuning of the cosmological constant is around one part out of 10 to the 120th. Most scientists think that the universe is fine-tuned for our existence. The real debate is how do you explain it? Many worlds or a designer? I think I've just shown why the many worlds hypothesis doesn't solve the problem. What about objective moral values and duties in the world? Um, Dr. Cross says, well, what if God reset morality so that raping little children is wrong? That won't work on my divine command morality theory because I maintain that God has certain properties like being compassionate, kind, just, fair, so that his commandments are necessary expressions of his essence, of his character. And therefore, there is no possible world in which God would command that rape would be good and love would be bad. But in any case, on his view, you can't say anything is bad because there are no objective moral duties and values. And if you think that that is implausible, then I think you should agree with me that God exists. Finally, as to the resurrection of Jesus, we've not heard any grounds for denying what the majority of historians think about the fate of the historical Jesus, the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the Christian faith. And it seems to me those are clearly better explained if God exists than if he doesn't. So in summary, it seems to me that while the evidence isn't open and shut, nevertheless, God's existence is more probable given these five facts than it would have been without them. And for the limited purposes of tonight's debate, that's enough to prove that there is evidence for God. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Dr. Krauss. Dr. Craig is, is fixated on probabilities. Um, I'm fixated on evidence. They're not the same. Evidence is falsifiable. Evidence is something I can test. I can argue about probabilities, and especially when I don't have an underlying theory, the probabilities don't mean a lot. When I don't have a mathematical, in fact, probabilities only make sense in the concept of a mathematical construction. Otherwise, they're just shooting in the dark. Of course, 
what he what Dr. Craig has argued is on the basis of the evidence, the probability is greater than not than there is a God. I don't like to necessarily use probabilities, but I'll use one probability. I'll take the members of the National Academy of Sciences, who are scientists, who looked at the evidence. Okay? Ninety percent of the members of the National Academy of Scientists don't find any evidence for God. They don't believe in God. They were they were they were uh, polled. Now, does that mean there's no God? It doesn't mean it at all. It means 90% of the best scientists in the country who look at the evidence find no evidence for God. If that's a probability. That's a probability I can actually quantify, not one I invented in my head. So somehow, the scientists involved who look at the evidence that Dr. Craig has presented don't see any evidence for God. 90% of them. Okay? Now, not even 50%. If it was 51%, we, according to Dr. Craig, we'd win, but 90% don't believe in, in, in God. Now, the claim Alex Vilenkin has one model of, uh, of creating universe from nothing, which I actually worked on around the same time. Um, it's different than Stephen Hawking. We don't know which is correct at this point, because we don't have a good theory of quantum gravity. But they're very different. In, in, in quantum gravity, uh, unlike what Dr. Craig has said, and, and, and uh, you'll have to trust me on this because I actually know general relativity, is that there is no free space. It's not that a free space is, it existed before tunneling. There is no free space. In the same sense that any of those particles that I showed in the, in, in, uh, in, um, coming from empty space existed before, before they, before quantum fluctuations produced them. They didn't exist. They d exist for a short time, so short you can't measure them, and then they cease to exist. That's the way the world works. In quantum gravity, it, there's no pre-existing free space. It just is created. So that notion is, is not, uh, not uh, correct. Whether or not the universe is past eternal or not, which is, again, uh, uh, something Dr. Egg is fixated on, is, not, is itself in a very fascinating question. In the theory, by the way, of that he's talking about, uh, one version of the theory, the universe is future eternal. So it is eternal. Uh, it had a beginning. There are other versions, however, in which, it, in which case it is not. It is past eternal. It, it is eternal over all time. But that question itself, I repeat, the beginning of the universe is a fascinating thing. We know our observable universe have, had a beginning. We know that. That's not a, a, that's not a philosophical statement. It's a scientific one. And I repeat that evidence involves science, not philosophy. Philosophy doesn't define evidence for anything. It provides a logical framework for understanding things, but the only thing that determines evidence is reality, empirical reality, not philosophy. And you have to ask yourself the question each time, I repeat, that Dr. Craig claims that this requires God, is there a plausible physical explanation? And I've already shown you that space can be created from nothing plausibly. It's possible in, in a multiverse that the laws of physics, the laws of nature themselves are created spontaneously. They didn't pre-exist. It's possible. You have to ask yourself, am I willing to say that because all of these possibilities are interesting, but I don't understand them, it, there must be a God who's compassionate, kind, what were the words you used? Compassionate, kind, uh, some, a bunch of other words to describe him or her. Um, well, that's true, by the way. First of all, that's clearly not the God of the Old Testament. He's not compassionate nor kind, right? He's, that's obvious. So it's a certain kind of God that you choose to be compassionate and kind. But hold on. Isn't God, doesn't God define those things? But if he's, if he's required to be kind and compassionate, then who required him to be kind and compassionate? Who defined kind and compassionate? Get out of the middleman. Rationality defines kind and compassion. All of you, if you did not believe in God, and the people in here who find the evidence for God lacking, are unlikely to go out and kill someone or rape someone tonight because of that. Rationality is, goes a long way to understanding morality. Rationality, evolution, biology. Does it completely define morality? I don't know. In fact, the institute that I run had a, had a wonderful uh, workshop on the origin of morality to try and look at neurophysiological basis, philosophical basis of morality. Because instead of by signing, deciding by fiat 
that the only origin of morality could be God, we want to look at the question and ask. And so, let's, I promised I'd get to fine tuning, so let's get to fine tuning. What Dr. Craig gets wrong is that the entropy of the universe is not fine tuned, it's generated. We have a dynamical mechanism to generate it. I've heard him say the matter, that these certain quantities are not determined by the laws of physics. Well, most of them are. The matter antimatter asymmetry, which he says is fine tuned for light, which is it, by the way, is also, we have a mechanism to determine it. We do know that there are quantities whose values are very weird, like the value of the energy of empty space, which he said is fine tuned to be 10 to the minus 120. Well, that's true. It's fine tuned. I was one of the first people to show that. But it's fine tuned within the context of physical theory. Our physical theories predict it should be 120 orders of magnitude larger than it is. We don't understand why it's as small it is, as it is. But its smallness does not fine tune for life. If it were zero, which is what we thought it was, life would exist perfectly well. And it's much easier to understand why it's zero from a mathematical perspective, which is why all of us theoretical physicists thought it was, until the universe told us it wasn't. All logic, all science, told us that the only sensible value for the energy of empty space, in which there's nothing, was nothing. And life would exist perfectly well in such a universe. And what did we discover? It's not nothing. We still don't understand why. It's the biggest mystery in science. It's, it means we don't understand most of the universe. What could be more exciting? But what we have learned, by the way, is the fact that it isn't nothing means we live in the worst of all possible universes for life to develop in. A universe with energy and empty space has life ending before any universe in which empty space doesn't have energy. So if this miraculous fine-tuning, which, which I agree is remarkable and I wish I'd understand, was created for life, then the person who created it didn't do a very good job. A rather competent, intelligent designer. The universe is the way it is, whether we like it or not. And all the evidence of the universe is that there's no purpose, no design, no meaning. Should that upset us? No, and I'll explain why in the next, in my concluding remarks. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. We now enter the uh, summary segment. And Dr. Krauss, this is a final. This is it. Oh, okay. In tonight's debate, I've tried to show you that God's existence is more probable given certain facts, then it would have been without them. And that is by definition what it means to say that there's evidence for God's existence. First of all, we looked at the existence of contingent beings, and I explained that given the existence of God, it is more probable that contingent beings would exist than on atheism, because on atheism there is no explanation for the existence of contingent beings. And to try to say that there need not be an explanation for the existence of uh, the universe uh, is arbitrary and unjustified. It commits the taxicab fallacy. So I think the very existence of contingent beings makes God's existence more probable than it would otherwise have been. Secondly, what about the origin of the universe? I used both philosophical arguments and scientific evidence to show that the universe began to exist. Dr. Krauss dropped his objections to the philosophical arguments. We saw that while the infinite is a useful mathematical concept, when you try to translate it into the real world, it results in self-contradictory situations. And therefore, the past must be finite. And we saw, secondly, that this is indeed what science has confirmed. The bohr guth vilenkin theorem shows that the quantum vacuum out of which our material state has evolved uh, cannot be eternal in the past, but must have had a beginning. The hartle hawking model itself that Dr. Krauss has appealed to involves an absolute beginning of the universe. He says, however, that this universe explains how it came into existence from absolute non-being. And I contradicted that by saying that the point from which the universe quantum tunnels is not nothing on these models. Listen to what Hartle and Hawking write in their scholarly article on this. They say the volume vanishes at the north and south poles, even though these are perfectly regular points of the four geometry. One therefore would not expect the wave function to vanish at the vanishing three volume. In the case of the universe, we would interpret the fact that the wave function can be finite 
and non-zero at the zero three geometry as allowing topological fluctuations of the three geometry. So they're, they're clearly not talking about something coming from nothing. Indeed, I mean, think about it, folks. There is no physics of non-being. That's absurd. There's only a physics of things that exist that are real. So it's impossible for physics to explain how being could arise from non-being. There is no physics of non-being. And therefore, given that the universe did have an absolute beginning, I think it fairly cries out for the existence of a transcendent cause of the universe, which is most plausibly identified as God, rather than some abstract object. What about the fine-tuning of the universe? Here, Dr. Krauss attacked one example of fine-tuning, the um, low entropy condition, and he says that this is explicable by a mechanism that determines the fine-tuning. I, I beg to differ. Robin Collins, who has occupied himself extensively with this, writes, the universe started in a very low entropy state. It is enormously improbable for the universe to have started in the macro state necessary for the existence of life. The various ways of avoiding this improbability are all highly problematic. And in particular, he looks at Penrose's suggestion that the low entropy is the result of a very special law and says that Penrose's proposal has not been accepted uh, by the majority of physicists today. So, Look, we've got this universe that in multiple ways is fine-tuned for our existence. And that obviously, I think, makes the existence of God more probable than it would have been without them. It is highly improbable that this fine-tuning is going to go away. Ernan McMullen of the University of Notre Dame says it seems safe to say that later theory, no matter how different, will turn up approximately the same numbers. And the numerous constraints that have to be imposed on these numbers are too specific and too numerous to evaporate entirely. So fine-tuning is a physical feature of the universe, and I think it's better explained by God. Quickly then, what about moral values and duties? Here Dr. Krauss said you can define kind and compassionate independent of God. Of course you can. That is a question of moral semantics. Mine is an argument concerning moral ontology. That is to say, not the definition or meaning of terms, but their grounding in reality. And apart from God, there is no foundation for objective moral values and duties. Therefore, if you believe that they exist, then you should believe in God. Finally, the resurrection of Jesus. He's never denied those historical facts concerning the fate of Jesus of Nazareth. And that gives good reason to believe that the best explanation of these facts is that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. And that entails that God exists. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Dr. Krauss, your summary. Just so you know, I want to show my, my that last little bit. If you want to put my computer up in a second, okay, good. We'll get to Richard Fine in a second. Um, the uh, the five points that Dr. Craig has made: contingent beings. Somehow he argues that, that natural phenomena cannot explain things which didn't have to exist. It's something I, I find remarkable. Um, many things didn't have to exist. You didn't have to exist here on Earth, but we understand a series of, of, of steps by which you were caused to exist naturally, including a, a large comet that, just, that, killed the, the, that fell in the Yucatan and killed the dinosaurs, making an evolutionary age for mammals. None of that was required. But more importantly, in fact, if you wish, uh, it, the, the it, contingent beings, in fact, must exist in a universe whether, whether or not there's a God. Because if there are many universes, having diff different laws of physics, there must exist one universe in which contingent beings exist. And you can ask yourself, in which universe will those people ask the question? They'll ask the question in the universe in which they exist. If there are many universes, there must be a universe in which we exist. Our existence does not prove anything except that we exist. And in fact, it's required if that existence is at all possible. In fact, the laws of physics tell us that which is not prohibited is required. That which is not impossible must happen somewhere. That's the other amazing thing about the universe. The strangest things are happening every second. Because that which, those things which don't violate the laws of nature are required. 
And in many universes, if there's one universe in which life can exist, it will exist, and then it will ask itself the question, why do I exist? The origin of the universe. There are no, first of all, let me point out, there are no contradictions, I totally agree. There are no contradictions with infinities that I know of. No mathematical contradictions. I don't like it physically, but it's possible. And if it's true, I'll have to learn to live with it. I'll just have to learn to live with it. I don't know if it's true. I'll find out. I do repeat, however, unfortunately, Dr. Craig, when he talked about the fact that the wave function is not zero at the boundaries, is interesting, but the wave function is not a physical quantity. It's a mathematical quantity that determines probabilities. So what it's saying is that the probability of creating a universe is not zero. Great. That means the probability that something will come from nothing is not zero, without God, by the very example he used. The, the fine-tuning, I, I wish I could, I, I wish I could clarify this for Dr. Craig. In fact, Alan Guth, who he keeps trying to, he keeps invoking like a mantra, developed a theory, which is the only theory we have that explains, I was going to show you the data, it explains all the data in cosmology. It's a beautiful theory, it's called inflation. It's a theory that arises naturally given the laws of particle physics. And it's a theory where the entropy of the universe increases by 10 to the 80th in a time frame of 10 to the minus 35 seconds naturally, by known laws of physics. It is, in fact, the way we believe the current entry of the universe developed, because it's so beautiful, and it also explains what we see. There's no problem creating entropy. There's also no problem creating space. There's no problem creating energy. You can have a universe with fine energy get bigger and bigger and bigger, because gravity has something called negative specific heat and negative pressure. It's really weird, but it's true, whether or not Dr. Dr. Craig likes it or not. Those aspects that he finds peculiar about our universe are in every way that I know of understandable by known dynamical physical processes. Moreover, the universe we live in is not fine-tuned for life. No one knows that because we do not know the different kinds of life that can exist. As for morality, he assumes I assume there's no objective reality of morality. I, I've never said that. I don't know where he gets that idea. Of, but I, what I do claim is that whether morality is objective or not is a question for us to determine an objective morality does not require God because, in fact, for the reasons I said earlier, God, if God exists, is not, if there's objective morality, then God doesn't have the freedom to determine the morality, decide that it's compassionate and kind. Well, some people think it's compassionate and kind to sexually molest and disfigure young women. It's compassionate and kind to ensure that they do not enjoy sex. That's compassionate and kind. Their God tells them to do it. Okay? I think you would read, you would agree that that, that we just should get rid of the middleman and decide what's compassionate and kind on the basis of common sense. As for the resurrection, let me make it clear right now. By far, since all of the evidence, the historical evidence, is determined by anecdotal uh, eyewitness arguments made by eyewitnesses 50 years after the fact, it is far more likely that the resurrection is imagined than real. Just as I think Dr. Craig would argue it's far more likely that Muhammad didn't rise to heaven on a horse, but someone said he did, and people believed it. And the fact that people believe it, the fact that people are willing to die for it now, means nothing any more than it does in the fact that people are willing to fly planes into New York for, uh, to, because they believe that someone rose on a horse to heaven. And I know Dr. Craig doesn't believe that, because I've heard it. So none of these, these arguments he's given give evidence for anything except a wonderful universe that we are trying to understand. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. At this, at this time, I, I would ask you, the audience, to perform your role as members of the jury. The arguments have been presented. It's now your duty to decide whether there's sufficient evidence of the existence of God. Uh, if you would take your comment cards. Uh, you are the sole judges of the weight to be given to the arguments of each panelist. In deciding whether or not you believe there is sufficient evidence of the existence of God, you should use the same tests of reliability that you apply in your everyday lives. Consider whether or not the positions are reasonable and whether or not they are consistent with other arguments made. In other words, apply common sense. The question is whether or not uh, the greater weight of the evidence supports the existence of God. The greater weight of the evidence refers to the quality and convincing force of the evidence. It means that you must be persuaded considering all the evidence. Either it's sufficient to support the existence of God or not. If you're persuaded that by 
this evidence, there's uh, right away to the evidence that uh, that God exists, and it would be your duty to answer in favor of Dr. Craig's posi position, and if you're not so persuaded, you should answer in favor of Dr. Krause's position. After you voted, please fill out the remainder of the comment card. Feel free to provide any honest comments you have about tonight's program. And at the end of this program, you will be able to drop your cards in a bucket as you leave. We'll take just a minute to allow you to do that. At this time, we will enter the question and answer segment. Uh, during the question and answer segment, you'll be given the opportunity to ask questions of our panelists. Let me emphasize that this is a time for you to pose a question and not a time for you to make a statement. If you launch into a commentary, I will interrupt you. The panelists to whom you address your question will have two minutes to answer, followed by a one-minute rebuttal by the opponent. We will alternate microphones. We will continue until our 30 minutes expires. You will see microphones in the aisles. You figured it out. You're already standing there. If you have a question for Dr. Kraus, use the microphone to your left. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. Craig, use the microphone to your right. And you have 30 seconds to pose the question. Again, let me state questions, not comments, and be respectful. Panelist, are you ready? Um, sure, why not? Okay, we'll have the first question. Um, yes, uh, Dr. Krause said that if he saw the stars rearranged in the sky to say, uh, I'm here, he would consider that possible evidence for the existence of God. Uh, my question, Dr. Craig, is uh, what evidence would you consider that says that your position on the existence of God is not true? What evidence would I consider to disprove the existence of God? Yes, can, what evidence do you make? Well, I think one of the most powerful arguments against God's existence would be the problem of evil. Uh, that was alluded to tonight. If you could show that it's improbable that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world, that could count. If you could show there was some kind of internal contradiction in the concept of God, that would count, obviously, against God's existence. Um, so those would be a couple of arguments that one would typically hear if tonight we were debating, is there evidence against God? But that wasn't the topic tonight. Thank you. Hang, hang, on, hang on, hang on. I uh, get my minute? That's correct. I, um, I'll be even stronger, or actually I'll be, I'll be the opposite, of course. Um, I don't think you can disprove the existence of God. That's the problem. I, I think it's absolutely impossible to disprove the existence of God. Um, you could, there's positive, there's evidence, in, uh, positive evidence of the type I claimed, or God making a YouTube um, uh, uh, video during an era when there's actually an ability to record evidence, not just hearsay. Uh, and so I think um, I can't disprove the existence of God any more than I, as Bertrand Russell said, I can disprove the existence, the possible existence of a teapot orbiting Jupiter right now. I can't disprove that right now. Can't. But is it? But on the basis of everything we know, is it likely? That's the kind of question we can ask. And as I say, that me and the proponents of scientists around the world think that there's no evidence for God. That's, however, I repeat, different than saying there's no God. I didn't come here to say that. I just asked if there's evidence. Okay. Thank you. We'll hear from this side. Okay. Um, my question is for Dr. Krauss. Uh, you touched on this a little. Arguments for religion often fall in two categories. The first arguing that the exist for the existence of God the second arguing that if a god exists, it would be it would care about us or be the god of a particular religion. Which class of arguments do you find weaker? Those saying that God exists or those stating that given the existence of God, it would be a particular god? Thank you. Well, I, th I think the second argument is clearly weaker because um, the only difference between an atheist and a Christian is, is that the Christian is an atheist about every other religion 
And I'm just, if I called myself an atheist, just one more religion I don't believe in. Uh, but the point is, I actually think deism, the, the possible existence of a divine intelligence, is not an implausible postulate. And um, I, I won't argue against it. It could be. I mean, the universe is an amazing place. I, the question is, is there evidence for that? That's what we try to debate. So I think the possible existence of a divine intelligence is perfectly plausible and addresses some of the perplexing issues associated with the beginning of the universe. And it may, it may indeed, um, ultimately, we may find that it's required. But the, but the relationship between that and the specific God that some people believe in here and the specific God that other people believe in here is obviously a problem because not everyone can be right. And everyone believes this fervently. Most people who are fundamentalists in their religions believe this fervently that their religion is right and everyone else is wrong. And they can't all be right. And the, and the point is that uh, they're probably all wrong. In fact, I should say it more clearly. Science is incompatible with the doctrine of every single organized religion. It is not incompatible with deism. But it is incompatible with Christianity, Judaism, and uh, and Islam if you take literally the the doctrine and completely the doctrine of the scriptures of those religions. I'm not sure I understood your question. Could you rephrase it? Um, so the question is about whether or not you think the evidence for a general God existing uh, is better than the argument saying, ah. given a God existing, it's the God of one religion. Okay. Well, I don't think the way people argue for particular religions is the way you described it. But I do think there's a multiplicity of arguments for monotheism or deism, as Lawrence Krauss described it. And the first uh, three argu four arguments I gave would be arguments for a kind of generic monotheism, a creator, a designer, a necessary being, a ground of moral values. The fifth argument that I gave would be the one to say that this God has revealed himself, especially in Jesus of Nazareth. So I think there are more arguments for theism in general than there are for any specific uh, type of theism. But that being said, the, the evidence for Christian theism is actually very good, especially when it comes as the capstone to a case in which you've established a creator, a designer, a ground of moral values. Then to say that that being already proved has revealed himself in Jesus, I think becomes very plausible in light of the resurrection. Thank you. We'll have a question from this side now. Hi, Dr. Craig. Hi. Uh, Throughout this debate, I noticed you concentrated on uh, formal logic um, in instead of science, uh, which talks about the ev evidence. Uh, my question is, through logical argumentation, how would you prove a necessity of purpose or grand design if you were to assume that there was an ultimate cause? How would I argue for the existence of, uh, of, of uh, purpose and design? The necessity of purpose or grand design. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure I would argue for the necessity of them. What I would argue is, as I did in my debate with Richard Dawkins, is that if God does not exist, then ultimately there is no purpose for the universe. But that if God does exist, then it follows that there is purpose for the universe because God created it for a reason. So I would see the question of purpose as depending on the existence of God. It's a conditional claim. If atheism is true, we exist to no purpose, everything will perish in the heat death of the universe. But if there is a God who exists, then that provides grounds for thinking that he has created the world for a reason. And on Christian theism, it's for the reason that we can know God personally and be in relationship with him. The fulfillment of human existence is found in relation to God. So I see the question of purpose in life or meaning to existence as deriving from the question of the existence of God. Uh, um, okay, uh, let's see. What is amazing, well, I don't think formal logic can prove anything about the universe. Formal logic is a methodology, but if we relied only on formal logic, we wouldn't have modern science. We need to explore, the, we need to let the universe tell us how it behaves. Then we apply rational log logic and mathematics. But uh, so formal logic alone doesn't prove anything. Let me make that quite clear. It often leads to, uh, when it comes to the real universe, false conclusions. But uh, the interesting question is, um, 
the universe appears purposeless. Everything you can see about the universe, the universe everything about we know about the universe appears as if it doesn't exist for us. It appears, so God created a universe that looks like a universe that, in fact, we are just completely insignificant, a vast universe of hundreds of billions of galaxies made of stuff that isn't us, that wouldn't be any different if we weren't here. The universe would be essentially identical. So the question is, does a universe that appears to be without purpose, without purpose? The answer is, I don't know. But uh, that's the way it appears. And so God may have just made it appear that way because he wants to trick us. I don't know. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. Next question, Dr. Krauss. Uh, Dr. Krauss, um, oh, I see. If, right. if infinity, if not, if infinity implies there's a contradiction, then there must not be infinity. And if God is infinite and there's not infinity, then there must not be. Then, like according to that logic, there's not God. Um, is that logic correct? And how does it affect the evidence presented in the debate? Well, you know, it's an interesting question for a variety of words. First of all, I repeat, infinity is not inconsistent. It's a well-defined mathematical quantity. And we use that, we use infinities in physics all the time to calculate things. So it's, it's, it, 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 we, we depend on them in, in residue calculus and complex variables. We, we depend on the existence of infinities in order to calculate the electric field around an object. All sorts of interesting things. But, but the interesting question is, indeed, that's where I talk about the late, in my mind, intellectual laziness. There are big questions having to do with infinity, questions that give you headaches. That's why we don't like to think about it. So when you don't like to think about it, you say, God. Because I've heard, actually, the interesting thing is I heard uh, Dr. Craig, I was listening to him in, uh, debate my friend Christopher Hitchens, and he said, well, you know, but God, is, God, can exi God isn't rushed. God has an infinite amount of time to do things. Well, if God has an infinite amount of time to do things, why doesn't the universe? And so every time you run up with these quantities, which are hard to understand, you would trade it into this being you don't understand. And that, I think, is intellectual laziness. And the reason, I think, that Weinberg has said that, and I happen to agree with him in some sense, that religion is perhaps the greatest assault on human dignity that he knows of. What I argued is that while the concept of the actual infinite is a useful and consistent concept in set theory and transfinite arithmetic, it cannot be translated into the real world. Because in transfinite arithmetic, you have certain rules that prohibit certain operations, like subtraction and division. Because when you try to subtract infinity from infinity, you get self-contradictions. But if you can have an infinite number of marbles, for example, nobody can stop you from giving away half of the marbles, in which you're going to get these sort of contradictions. So, of course, infinity is a well-defined concept, given its rules. Now, does that mean that God can't be infinite? The infinity of God is not a mathematical concept. <laughs> that is a qualitative concept, not a quantitative concept. It means God is omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, necessary, all good. It has nothing to do with mathematical infinity. Similarly, when we say God has infinite amount of time to do things, what I meant, Dr. Krauss, is he has potentially infinite time uh, in the future. But we're talking here about whether the past can be actually infinite. That's very different. Thank you. Thank you. Next question for Dr. Craig. Hey, Dr. Craig. Uh, yes. Scientific theories make testable predictions. For example, Newtonian gravity predicted the existence and location of Neptune. Uh, you're going to have to talk slower and more clearly, uh, please. Okay. Well, here's a question. Uh, what testable predictions does the God hypothesis make? What testable predictions does the God hypothesis have? Well, if Christianity is true, we should find that uh, the evidence supports that, they, that Jesus rose from the dead. That uh, if you could show that Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that would falsify Christianity. If theism is true, uh, it would predict that the universe would exhibit characteristics that uh, are designed for the existence of intelligent life like us. If you could show that's false, that would falsify that. Uh, um, if uh, biblical theism is true, the universe should have a beginning. If you could falsify that, that would be problematic for biblical theism. So um, uh, I think that the existence of God is something that's definitely related to the evidence. And, and the evidence that I gave tonight, I think, increases the probability that God exists than if we didn't have that evidence. And that's all I've tried to show. It's a, it's a very modest claim. 
uh, well, boy, if that's a modest claim. Okay. Um, the, I, I, it's an interesting question. Um, you, as Dr. Craig, Dr. Craig pointed out, the answer depends upon your theology. If you're Christian, you have to believe, you, you, maybe you're required to believe in the resurrection. Maybe you're required to believe in a virgin birth, although on a stage with four Christians, including someone of the Vatican, I couldn't get a single person to say they've actually believed in virgin birth. Um, uh, but, or you may believe that Muhammad rose from a horse to heaven, from a horse to heaven, if you believe that. You might say if those things are not true, the th that the theology is, 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 is not true. But that doesn't disprove the existence of God. It doesn't. So God, the, the existence of an abstract God doesn't make any predictions. In fact, interestingly, I'm surprised to hear Dr. Craig fall into the, what I would have thought would be a trap that he say, he just said to this questioner here that God is not physical. God is beyond physical. Therefore, Anything's possible. God can do anything God wants, and therefore, there's absolutely nothing that God couldn't do, and therefore, therefore, you can, you know, God could smite me right now. Smite me. He didn't. But he could have, or she could have, I should point out. But, uh, so, you know, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, stop. I gotta Thank stop. Okay. Next question for Dr. Krauss. Dr. Krauss, you responded to Dr. Craig about Jesus rising from the dead by saying that it simply could have been imagined. But Dr. Craig, Craig said that assuming Jesus did rise, God existing and having risen Jesus himself would be the best explanation. Why wouldn't plenty of other options be better explanations, such as some physical phenomenon we don't know about yet, or actual people having intervened? Those seem more likely unless we assume God exists in the first place. Well, your point is well taken. You have to assume God exists at some level. The question is, What's more likely in the resurrection of Jesus? Something which is real. No one has ever else been resurrected that we know of. Uh, no one's actually witnessed it today. People don't die and uh, three days later arise from the tomb. It ha it's a historical claim which Dr. Craig says some historians seem to accept. But, but I, I, I've debated alien abduction people a lot, okay? And people who believe in aliens. And they, and they believe fervently. They can tell me the exact Everything that happened and all the weird, kinky sexual experiments that were done to them on the spacecraft. But again, to invoke Richard Feynman, what he says about those kind of things is it's more likely due to the known irrationality of humans than the unknown rationality of aliens. And when it comes to the resurrection, the point is that there are many, many claims that are much more simply explained by being imagined, illusion, or in some sense, as you're pointing out, being done by people who wanted to make the person they believed in appear to be God. I, I'm not claiming any of those is true, but it's quite logical. Just like when someone tells me about an alien abduction, I can say no matter how implausible it is that I can swamp gas or something else caused you to see those flying saucers, the laws of physics tell me it is so implausible that alien intelligence would be able to create a spacecraft that could come here and would come here that almost any other physical explanation is more plausible. To me, the resurrection is so implausible and also so undocumented that any other explanation is more plausible, in particular the most likely one, the same one that I think falsely makes people think that Muhammad rose to heaven, the same explanation that, that, that I don't believe the earth stood still uh, when, when a trumpet was blown because it would have killed everyone on earth, there would have been a tsunami, it would have been far worse than anything that happened in, in Japan. So it's much more likely that these have uh, other explanations. The most likely explanation is that it didn't happen at all. Craig's rebuttal. The historical facts that undergird the inference to Jesus' resurrection are agreed to by most New Testament historians today. The empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, the origin of the Christian faith. This is not undocumented. These are not in themselves supernatural. And these are accepted by the wide majority of New Testament historians. So the question is, how do you best explain them? And what I would invite you to do is to look at the work that I've published, as well as others, who have written on this, uh, as to comparing the other explanations, like conspiracy theory, the disciples stole the body, apparent death theory, the hallucination theory. Down through history, there have been a multiplicity of counter explanations of these facts, and none of them has commanded the uh, adherence of a great number of scholars, because they all fail in terms of their explanatory scope, their explanatory power, their ad hoc, their implausible. They all fail those standard tests for historical explanation that historians use. So once you get rid of your bias against the possibility of miracles, this sort of human argument, I don't see any reason to think that the best explanation isn't the one the disciples gave. 
that God raised him from the dead. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig, Dr. Craig, if if the divine commands of God are the objective basis and moral values, how do we find out those commands? Ah. And how how um, how do we gain access to those objective moral values and know that we've correctly yeah. done so? Thank you for this question because it helps us to draw a distinction that is so often misunderstood and blurred. I said in my last speech, I'm talking about moral ontology. That is to say, what is the foundation in reality for moral values and duties? I'm not talking about moral semantics, the definition of moral terms. Neither am I talking about moral epistemology, which is your question, how do we know the moral values and duties that we have? There, I am completely open to any sort of moral epistemology that someone might want to uh, suggest. Uh, moral intuition, uh, divine revelation, uh, logical inference from the intrinsic value of human persons. I don't carry any brief for any particular moral epistemology. Uh, my argument is simply that in the absence of God, uh, we don't have any ground for affirming the existence of objective moral values and duties. And I think that's the position that Dr. Krauss is committed to in view of his determinism and his scientism. Since ought implies can, and on his view, we cannot do anything other than what we do, we cannot say that we ought to have done otherwise. We have no moral responsibilities. And moreover, since science cannot establish the objectivity of moral values, uh, it follows that we have no uh, moral values that are objective either. So in a... In a, in a world determined by this sort of uh, scientific naturalism, there just are no moral truths. It's, it's a moral anti-realism. And if you find that implausible in light of your moral experience, then uh, I think you should agree that God exists. So that's the only argument that I'm making tonight, and not one about some moral epistemology. Thank you, Dr. Craig. I mean, Krauss. That's OK. Um, all, people always are confused. Um, uh, the, um, Let's see. I, Dr. Craig keeps telling me I'm a scient that I have scientism. That means that I think there's nothing other than science, and of course that's wrong. Um, I also at one point said, and I, have no, I don't think there's free will. How will we act like we have free will? And I think it's indistinguishable. Um, because the universe is very complicated, because we're made of 10 to the 24th particles, uh, the, the, uh, and, uh, we, we act effectively like we have free will. But what is clear to me from your question and from Dr. Craig's answer is, that there, no one can determine from God what moral, what is morally right. Because if you look at different religions, they all come up with contradictory views of what's morally right. So these people who are trying to understand the nature of God that they believe in come up with answers which are completely different. On the other hand, everyone I know that is rational comes up with answers to what should be done based on what they know about the universe, which is the same. So uh, if there is a God that determines morality, what's obvious from human history and from experience is that no religious people come up can determine the mind of God because not all of them could be right. Just like uh, the reason I, I um, have a bias against miracles is for 30 years I studied the universe and I've never, ever known of one. Thank you, Dr. Krauss. The next question is for Dr. Krauss. Uh, my name is Daniel Foster, and I'm from the UNC Greensboro Atheist, Agnostics, and Skeptics Group. Number one. Anything that exists has an explanation. Number two, God exists. Number three, if God exists, a cosmic fluffy crushiness is the explanation. Number four, a super cosmic fluffy crushiness exists. Dr. Krauss, can you explain why that is equally absurd as Dr. Craig's first point in his presentation? I thought you were making a comment. I was sure the judge was going to stop you there, but I was but, uh, um, uh, <laughs> um, well, look. I think you I think the point you're making. Uh, it, let me rephrase it in a way that I understand. I, 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 is that um, it, the, the question has to arise? What's the cause of God? What if God? If if everything has an explanation, what's the explanation of God? And you can always ask. You can you can. You can be like a child and continue to ask that question ad nauseum. Why, why, why? And, and the interesting thing is we don't know the answer. But what seems to me is that what people say is, I get tired of asking that question, so I'm going to stop and just call it God. And, what, and that's what bothers me. It just seems intellectually lazy. Because 
I don't know if there's an ultimate answer. There may be no ultimate answer. I, that's what I was going to show from Feynman. There may be no ultimate answer to the universe. There may be no ultimate theory. But at some point, uh, I'm not. If I just stop and throw up my hands and say God, it's an it's just a lazy way of saying I don't know. Would you rebuttal? Well, what's lazy is to stop arbitrarily when you get to the universe. That's what's committing the taxicab fallacy to accept the principle of sufficient reason everywhere else until you get to the universe and then arbitrarily stop there. The theist doesn't arbitrarily stop when he gets to God as the explanatory ultimate. God has an explanation of his existence. Everything that exists has an explanation, either in the necessity of its own nature or if it's contingent in an external cause. God exists by a necessity of his own nature. Even the atheist recognizes that. If a being has a cause, it isn't God. Because God, by definition, is the metaphysical ultimate. So when you get to God, you've reached a metaphysically necessary being which has no cause of its existence, and its existence is explained by the fact that it exists by a necessity of its own nature, just like mathematical objects and other abstract objects. And that's why you don't run into the slushy crush or whatever it is that you were talking about. It would be logically impossible for God to be caused by a slushy crush or whatever it is. I was just trying to escape the thank circular you, logic thank of what you just said. Thank you. Thanks. Next question for Dr. Craig. I fear my question might be somewhat similar to his. A little yeah. louder, please. Yeah. I fear my question might be somewhat similar to his, but I'm going to go ahead and okay. ask it anyway. Um, so a lot of your argument was based on this question of eternity, how we cannot have an eternal past. Well, and that was my second argument. That was only one well, that was based on It's, it's the one I liked. It's the one I focused on. Um, and that everything must have an, an external cause. And you said that this external cause was God. Now, wait, you're confusing two arguments. Pardon me for interrupting you. The first argument says everything that exists has an explanation, but that might be in the necessity of its own nature or in the cause of its contingent. The second argument says everything that begins to exist has a cause. But I've already said that some things don't have causes, namely things that exist by necessity of their own so nature. So why does God They don't exist? begin to exist. So don't run these arguments together or you're going to come Letter up with contradictions. Yeah. So why does God exist by necessity of his own nature? Why is God not one of these abstract, why is God not one of these contingent beings? Why is God existent? Yeah, you're right. That is the same question the fellow asked because the concept of God is that of a uh, metaphysically necessary ultimate being. If you have a being that itself is caused by something else, you haven't reached God yet. You may have had a small g gods, you know, some humanoid sort of thing, but you haven't reached the concept of what God is, which is the creator of all reality, the metaphysical ultimate, a necessary being. So you've got to, you're, you're still dealing there with contingent beings. You've got to keep going higher. Uh, let's, let's have the rebuttal. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, and I think the answer is... I mean, you so Dr. Craig has defined God to be something um, that meets his question, his desire for necessity. So I define the multiverse to be that. Um, fine, the multiverse it always existed. It is without the multiverse, our universe couldn't have existed. Fine, let him call it God. I call it the multiverse. Uh, the diff my difference is that mine is motivated by physics, and his is motivated by uh, myths that are thousands of years old. It's a difference. Question for Dr. Krauss. Dr. Krauss, thank you for your, your time tonight. Uh, you have said you don't like philosophy and also that uh, belief requires empirical evidence. On what foundation do you hold to this claim of philosophical positivism? In other words, how do you know that we can only know by empirical falsifiable evidence? Can you prove this empirically? Look, uh, I, I think you're overstating what I said. I believe the question, the question before us was what is the word evidence? And I take evidence to be something which can be falsified. So um, there are, I do not deny that humans are, are, that there are many things. What Dr. Craig seems to think is that I think that there's nothing other than science that makes sense in the world. I don't think that at all. But when it comes to evidence and things I can falsify, then the empirical methods are the ways to determine reality. It works. It's worked very well. And all of, none of you would be here today if, it, if, if we hadn't relied on that methodology to, uh, to develop 
the modern world that we have. There are many things that I can't falsify. There are many things that, that um, uh, as a human, that I may feel, emotions, uh, that I may never be able to um, quantify, that I may never be able to falsify. Um, but I, I, uh, I, they're not evidence in the scientific sense. And uh, to me, that's the question here. Not what I, what I, you know, whether I believe I love someone, or whether I think I'm happy, or sad. Uh, one day we may have an explanation of those things. I don't know, but I'm willing to believe that there's much more into the universe than science can is appropriate to describe. Uh, that's perfectly possible. But science does what it does, and it determines nonsense from sense by testing. And that is the key. That is, I just wish that one idea would come through, that we don't determine what's true by what we like and what we don't like and what we wish and what we don't wish. In fact, what I wish for all of you students is that sometime during your time in this university, an idea you hold to be true and deep and at the very core of your being is proved to be wrong. Because Thank that you. produces an open mind, and that will make you better citizens and better people. Thank you. Rebuttal. Yeah, as I prepared for this debate, I often wish that Dr. Krauss would be more open to the possibility of theism than he appears to be. I think your question is right on target. He holds, or seems to hold, to an epistemology which says that we should only believe that which can be scientifically proven. And as your question revealed, that itself is a self-contradictory position because you can't scientifically prove that you should only believe that which can be scientifically proven. So when he says it distinguishes sense from nonsense, that's all line verificationism, isn't it? And positivism that went out with the 30s and 40s. The word. It's a, it's a self-defeating position. So. Evidence is much broader than what science tells us. Science is empirical evidence, but there is moral experience. There is philosophical and metaphysical uh, facts. There are historical facts. And I think that the God hypothesis is so powerful because it makes sense of such a broad range of the facts of human experience, including, but not limited to, scientific facts. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. One more here for Dr. Craig. Dr. Craig, in light of physical revelations like the quantized nature of charge, energy, and time, an informational, digital, or perhaps even computable view of the universe is scientifically tenable. Quantum randomness is a concern, but there are scientists who are of the educated opinion that there may be underlying laws governing the seemingly random phenomena. If the universe is fundamentally computable, could that be a viable, consistent theory of cosmogony? If so, what gaps are there left to fill for the God in the deterministic universe? I haven't in any way appealed to quantum indeterminacy being ontic, let us say being real rather than merely epistemic. Nobody knows what the correct physical interpretation of quantum mechanics are. We know that the equations work and are highly accurate in their predictions. But there are at least 10 different interpretations of the equations, and nobody knows which one is correct. And some of these are fully deterministic uh, and regard uh, indeterminacy as merely a feature of our subjective knowledge or consciousness. Sure. And I'm frankly very sympathetic to those deterministic features. But the reason I'm not a determinist is because I believe in the reality of the soul. I think that we're not just electrochemical machines. I'm a substance dualist. I think that human beings are body-soul composites, and that the soul works with the brain to think. As Sir John Eccles, the great uh, Nobel Prize winning neurologist, uh, once put it, the uh, mind uses the brain as an instrument to think. Um, and so given that uh, you have this sort of uh, view of human persons, I think that it's uh, it, we don't live in a deterministic universe, that there is such a thing as free will, and therefore there are such things as moral duties and values. And of course, God, being a non-physical entity who isn't described by the equations of quantum mechanics, is also a libertarian agent and has freedom to act in the world or 
on the world as he sees fit. So because I'm not a physicalist, I guess, that's why I see room for human freedom. Well, OK. Um, I'm, I'm surprised Dr. Gray began with quantum mechanics in that regard. But let me, make, let me clarify something. All theories of quantum mechanics are deterministic. Quantum mechanics is based on partial differential equations, which are deterministic. There's no indeterminism in the fundamental equations of quantum mechanics. There's, there's indeterminism in measurement, but the underlying theory, when you start with the data set, predicts unambiguously how the, how, the, how the world will evolve into the future. Measurements of it are deterministic, are indeterministic, but the theory is completely, as any partial differential equation is, is deterministic, just so we know. The soul is an, I, I, I actually propose an experiment for the soul, which I'd love to do in my physics of Star Trek. If we could make a transporter, and I could disassemble you and put you together. I'd like to know if you had a soul at the other end. It would be a great experiment, but we can't make one. But one of the things I, but your question is a really interesting one. And I've, I've done work on this. Turns out that we think, and given the fact that there's an energy of empty space, which makes us the worst of all possible universes to live in for the long-term future of life, there are actually a finite number of calculations you can perform, 10 to the 120. And if, given Moore's law, we'll have performed them in about 300 years. So um, um, enjoy it while you can. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, final question is for Dr. Krauss. My question is, uh, our universe came out of nothing. And if our universe came out of nothing, well, that must mean the other universes must have came out of nothing. So that means that our universe must have exerted a force, and that universe and that universe must have exerted a force on us. But as far as I'm aware, there, there isn't any forces that are exerted on us from outside universes. Now, is this because there's two universes that exert the same force? And if that's what it is, would this give evidence for or against a God? Well, it's a good question. It's a physics question. I like physics questions. Um, the answer is you got it wrong. Okay? Um, you're absolutely right. If our universe came from nothing, which is plausible, in fact, probably required, other universes could have come from nothing, especially if there's a multiverse. Or, it, or even, in fact, in a, in a, in a, in a free space, it's possible. But, there, but, in fact, those universes will not exert any force on each other because they're causally disconnected. As far as we know, for in fact, Einstein tells us that the forces we measure are restricted to propagate at the speed of light. Other universes that ha exist in spatial regions, which are separated us by us, which are in fact separating from us faster than the speed of light, which is allowed in general relativity, can never communicate to us, can never exert a force on us. So there's nothing there. Also, there's some ideas which I have mixed feelings about about the existence of possible extra dimensions. In such extra dimensions. Those universes also may not exert any force on us because the forces we measure may be restricted to our four-dimensional plane. So unfortunately, there's really no direct way to measure the existence of such universes by forces. It's not impossible. It's possible that, th that they could come into causal contact, and people have e explored those questions. The only way we'll know, but we might know about it, it might be more than metaphysics. It might become physics by the following way. If we had a theory, which we don't have, that explain why there are four forces in nature, why the proton is 2,000 times heavier than the electron, why gravity is, is 40 orders of magnitude weaker than electromagnetism. If we had a theory that explained all of that, but one of the implications of it was that there was an inflationary phase in the early universe during which there will become internal inflation, then we would, we would test 20 predictions of the theory and they'd all be right. And we'd be willing to postulate that the one we can't measure is the theory, if it walks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. Well, I would just want to uh, summarize by saying that uh, physical science deals with physical reality. And therefore, it is a gross misuse of ordinary language to use the word nothing to characterize either the quantum vacuum, which is a physical reality, or uh, the point from which the universe quantum tunneled into the current state we have in quantum gravity models. Uh, these are not non-being. And when the philosopher asks the question, why do contingent beings exist rather than nothing, he's using the word nothing in the philosophical sense of non-being. And there is no physics of non-being. When the universe comes into being, it doesn't transition from non-being into being. Uh, that would exist before it existed. Rather, it is an absolute beginning of existence. And therefore, that points to a transcendent cause a ground of being in a transcendent metaphysical reality, which I think is most plausibly identified as God. Thank you. I'm afraid that that ends our time for questions. I'd like to thank each of you, the jury, for your attention and your questions. 
thank you again, Dr. Krauss and Dr. Craig, for your part in uh, tonight's program. Let's give uh, each of them a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.